Um, our next speaker is Gunder Wagner, who received his undergraduate degree at the College for Chemical Engineering in Vienna, Austria, and his PhD from the University of Vienna. Following postdoctoral work, he became a faculty member at the University of Vienna, and in 1991, he accepted a position as professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University, where he has also served as department chair, with which I empathize. He is currently Allison Richard Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. His re research includes work on molecular evolution, the evolution of development, and evolutionary and population genetics theory. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the organizers of this uh, wonderful uh, symposium to uh, let me talk about evolvability. Uh, as you will see, we will just continue that theme that Mark has uh, initiated so we can also continue the discussion about those uh, issues. Um, I only will uh, use a slightly different uh, approach uh, and uh, directly address the question of evolvability in a broad uh, context. And I do this because uh, I think among the few remaining Achilles heels that are intellectually interesting and, and, and really uh, worth our attention, uh, the question of evolvability of complex organisms is one of them after they've disposed of you know, the problem of altruism and social behavior and evolution and so on. I think this is the one thing that uh, we need to do more uh, work uh, in the future. So uh, let's uh, start with uh, Evolutionary Biology 101, the standard model. This is uh, organisms as theorists see them. Uh, and then there's sort of a mutation happening and then there's selection going on and after a few rounds of them a miracle happens, <laughs> something like this. So I think that is the, the bottom line model that we all uh, believe in and that we are all uh, teaching. But the problem is that it is not intuitive. Uh, the way uh, this model is seen in the, in the broader public is something like this. You have a, 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 a bunch of material, then there's randomness, and then you have evolution. <laughs> well, that is not a, a, a joke that I came up with, uh, but that's what's used by creationists to make fun of evolutionary uh, biology. But I think there's a, a deep uh, problem there that you know, I think we need to address uh, seriously also among ourselves uh, to see you know, in what way we can actually answer this challenge. Um, so, and I want to point out that this problem is uh, one that is, has been with us uh, since the beginning of uh, Darwinian evolutionary uh, theory. And uh, of course, this famous quote from Darwin and uh, uh, origin of species is of course no accident that I use an eye here because uh, he was also reflecting on the probability that natural selection can actually uh, produce something as intricate and uh, tuned and complex as, uh, as the human or the vertebrate eye or the eye of a, of a, of a, of a uh, cephalopod. Uh, of course we all know that uh, uh, randomness doesn't act in you know, a tornado type of uh, way but it is a uh, relatively long and uh, stepwise process which leads from a uh, situation where we have essentially only photoreceptor cells in the skin, uh, sorry, that then gets uh, you know, uh, in, uh, increased in, in, into a little groove and then you have a, an, a, essentially something like a, a whole camera and then you develop a lens and so on. So that is part of the answer to the uh, uh, problem of how complex organisms can uh, evolve. And we all know that you know, most limitations have small effects, so it's not like a tornado. Uh, it's cumulative, and it's only random with respect to uh, the current need, ecological need of the, of the species. Uh, but they are not necessarily random with respect to phenotypic effects, as Mark has pointed out in uh, Amber Data in the previous talk. But on the other hand, there's still a remaining uh, problem that uh, another uh, founding father of our discipline has uh, worried about, and that is the problem uh, how such a process, a random process, can actually work when the number of relevant characters is large, if you have a highly dimensional uh, space. And uh, he tried to answer it with a simple uh, geometric model that's called uh, Fisher's geometric model. And you can think about uh, uh, all the points on this plane as different uh, phenotypes. And the red dot here indicates the, uh, the, you know, the phenotype is the highest uh, fitness. And these circles here around it are ESO fitness lines. It connects uh, phenotypes with the same fitness. And then if you have a 
a genotype starting out here and have uh, mutations, uh, mutations that go in this direction decrease fitness or in this direction that overshoot the target also have lower fitness only the ones that are within the target area have increased fitness and the probability uh, of and he asked what is the probability of having adaptive mutations if the dimensionality of this uh, uh, space is, is very high and his basic answer is the smaller the, the average effect of a mutation uh, then the uh, probability of success is approaching 0.5 because the curvature of this ease of fitness line becomes small relative to the size of this uh, ball here while if you have a larger ball there's a smaller fraction uh, inside the target area and here you have sort of the probability as a as a function of the size of the ball and that can of, of course be generalized you know, to n dimensions and you know you can think of complex adaptations as sort of a random walk uh, with selection in a very highly dimensional uh, Euclidean space. That's sort of the basis of uh, Fisher's geometric model. I think I can go here. Uh, I'm still in the camera, okay. Um, so, and that leads to a, a problem that uh, was coined as the problem of the cost of complexity uh, by uh, uh, Orr. And, uh, you know, I mean, one can disagree whether this is the right line or this is the right line, but essentially here we have a measure of the rate of evolutionary change in terms of change of fitness in, in time and this is a logarithmic scale and this is the number of dimensions that the phenotype is assumed to have and we can see an exponential decrease in the uh, rate of evolution and now I completely uh, destroyed here everything <laughs> oh, here we are yeah it's good to be a, a, a graduate of an engineering college so <laughs> Okay, uh, so so that's the that's the the problem. So random mutations can lead to improvements. We all know that there's lots of evidence, uh, but the origin of complex adaptation still remains a problem because of what mathematicians call the curse of dimensionality. If you have very ma many things to change, uh, then the likelihood to find a combination that is actually better than what you have can become very small, and so we need to think about. Uh, additional factors that may help us explain the evolution of complex uh, organisms. And I want to discuss a few uh, ways of how we can think about the problem, how this we can circumvent the problem of the curse of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of dimensionality. One I, I call divide and conquer. It has to do with the, pleiotro uh, with the pleiotropic effect. It's essentially picking up where uh, Mark uh, uh, started also, uh, and then also talk about whether pleiotropic ev uh, effects can evolve. And that came up in the discussion. I will give my, our answer to that. Then the other question is whether degrees of robustness of the phenotype can actually influence uh, evolvability in, in some predictable and positive way. And then there is a whole uh, literature that sort of argues that uh, uh, genetic variation gets actually stored in a non-visible, in a cryptic way, and there are mechanisms that can release this genetic variation when it is necessary, when there is uh, a stress uh, uh, affecting the population. And then there's a, an area that I'm particularly interested in, but I won't have time to talk about today, and that is the fact that the kind of molecular mut uh, mutations that are available to, uh, to a lineage can be quite uh, different depending on what, uh, whether there are transposable elements or not because transposable elements are so, something like prefabricated genetic switches and can increase the rate of evolution uh, when it comes to evo uh, evolution of gene regulation. Unfortunately, I th I'm pretty sure I, I, I'm not having time to talk about this today if I get through all of this anyway. So first let's talk about uh, divide and conquer. Uh, one of the assumptions in Fisher's model is the assumption of universal pleiotropy. Basically, the assumption that every mutation in, uh, is, has a potential to affect all of the uh, traits of the, of a, of the phenotype. Uh, but the question is whether that's actually a realistic assumption. So we have to ask how pleiotropic are real mutations. Because the alternative would be that it, there might be a more structured uh, way uh, genetic effects uh, um, are affecting the phenotype. It could be that genes tend to affect 
a subset of the, of the phenotypic traits and only have occasional uh, effects on, on alternative traits. And if these subsets of traits uh, correspond to different physiological functions, then you know, the actual problem of the dimensionality of the adaptive problem becomes much smaller than the total complexity of the phenotype. Basically, you divide the complex problem of evolving you know, all of the traits into solve independently solvable sub-problems uh, like mathematicians do. Uh, so we addressed this in a, one uh, a paper of ours together with uh, 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 Michaela and with Jim uh, Shevrod, da using data from the QTL study that has 70 phen phenotypic traits uh, all over the body from the skull, the body axis, limbs, and, and overall body weight. And this was uh, using 350 marker, identifying 102 QTLs affecting 1 to 30 traits uh, in this thing. The one thing that I want to point out uh, here is that if you look at the uh, frequency distribution of QTLs affecting different uh, number of traits, what we find is that the medium number of, tra uh, of traits of pleiotropy of these things are about 6, 5 or 6, so around this. While we have potentially 70 characters measured, so this is a very small fraction of the, of the, uh, of the effects that we can, uh, that potentially would have been uh, possible. And uh, in interestingly, in the same year, uh, Dolph Schluter's work, and I need to find, show a, a sticker back here because we are in Stony Brook, um, did a similar study with uh, 27 uh, landmark points, which of course uh, uh, gives you 54 uh, yeah, two-dimensional coordinates and then you know, some constraints you come also to about 50 or whatever um, characters and they also looked at the uh, pleiotropy of their QTLs and they have a mean uh, pleiotropic number of effects of per QTL of 3.5. Very small. There's a completely different approach was developed by Shun Gu um, from Iowa State University and he looked at some you know, statistical characteristics of uh, protein evolution from that, you know, so back calculated using uh, 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 Fisher's geometric model, the number of uh, characters it is likely to have uh, 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 effect, and here's the frequency distribution, and you have a median or mean value of about six to seven um, uh, phenotypes affected by each amino acid substitution. So I think we have a new nature constant. This is uh, the number of uh, average number of uh, pleiotropic effects per allele substitution somewhere between three and seven. We have it in you know, all kinds, we have it in fish, we have it in mice, so I think that we probably even have it in yeast, what I heard uh, recently. So, so that's of course, uh, so from that we can conclude that the genetic effects are highly structured, they are not random with respect to all possible uh, uh, phenotypes. Each substitution affects a relatively small number of traits which means that the effective complexity of the evolutionary process that's going on is much, much smaller than the potential total uh, complexity of the, uh, of the organism uh, itself. So now the question is, uh, um, how are these pleiotropic effects uh, uh, organized in terms of, you know, do they form modules or are there some overlapping sort of random things? And there's not a whole lot of uh, data out there. There's a little bit of data that sort of of course, this idea that genetic effects are organized in sort of a meaningful, biologically and functionally meaningful way is an old idea that goes back to Olson and Miller in the idea of morphological integration. And only recently there is uh, genetic data trying to test this, and this is one of these in cichlids, I think, uh, where they looked at QTLs for uh, man mandible uh, size or dimensions in uh, cichlids, and the interesting thing is that the, uh, the the, what's the uh, out lever and the uh, closing lever has shares two of three QTLs. There is uh, only one of five is with the opening lever and the out lever here, and there is no shared QTL between the closing lever and the opening lever, uh, arguing that it is more important to co-vary the size of uh, this here and the closing lever, and these two characters also have more uh, 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 QTLs uh, shared more, more QTLs with pleiotropic effects than any of the other functionally less uh, related characters. In an earlier study, uh, Jason Misi, uh, Jim, and myself looked at the distribution of, uh, uh, of uh, 
pleiotropic effects in the mouse mandible, and there are sort of two functional modules. The one is the actual uh, corpus of the of the of the mandible where the, the teeth are located, and here is the muscle attachment points and the and the uh, joint. And it turns out of all the many uh, QTLs, you find only six are actually have pleiotropic effects among uh, these two functional modules. And if you, you know, do a reasonable uh, statistical model of whether this is uh, less than expected, you come to very low p-values that this is uh, expected by chance. So it seems to be that pleiotropic effects are in some way uh, corresponding to functional uh, uh, subsystems in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the system. Now the question is why should this be that way? It either is by, you know, just by, by accident or can it be that this is actually uh, the result of natural selection? Uh, there are two ways how they can, you can think about it. There could be uh, initially uh, more pleiotropic effects and then some pleiotropic effects get sort of selected away and then you get sort of uh, these packages of genes and characters, or that there's less pleiotrop uh, pleiotropy and then selection for integration leads to uh, integration of previously independent characters. Again, there's not a whole lot of data that would tell us what's actually going on. There's some indirect evidence that's interesting from uh, Nathan Young and Halgrimson uh, that shows that, uh, uh, at, and this is on those of only phenotypic correlations, unfortunately, that of course there are correlations among serially homologous parts of the limb between you know, the femur and the humerus and tibia and radius and the metacarpus metatarsus in, uh, in quadrupedal uh, uh, species. But in the bat, where the uh, forelimb and the hind limb are functionally very uh, 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 specialized, the correlations between fore and hind limb, uh, in particular in the zygopodium uh, and in the, in the are very, very low. That is consistent with the idea that if uh, the two characters become functionally specialized, the degree of correlation between them is uh, decreasing. Again, I, this is not genetic data, but uh, you know, it's sort of suggestive. Now the question is, is there any um, genetic variation that could change pleiotropic effects? Um, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Jim invent, uh, invented a way to QTL map uh, genes that change the relationship, the variational relationship between phenotypic characters. And therefore, they are called uh, relationship QTL or RQTLs. And the way he does it, he looks for uh, differences in genotypes and marker genotypes uh, with respect to not a particular mean of a, of a character, but with respect to the regression between two characters. Okay? And that was a paper in 2004 and they found you know, all kinds of these uh, QTLs all over the genome. Uh, in, in this case, for, uh, for different characters, a relationship between the length and the depth of, of, uh, um, of the mouse mandible. In a more recent study, Michaela actually did it for more characters and uh, also found these RQTLs, but in addition found that the effects of the RQTLs are due to epistatic effects with QTLs at other parts of the loci. So it's not just a phenotypic effect that you, uh, that you get uh, uh, from the RQTLs, but it is probably to a large degree due to changes of the uh, interactions between RQTLs and other loci that actually cause the character. So that's uh, interesting, but the question is how would natural selection act on those RQTLs, those relationship QTLs? And uh, Jim's answer was this here. And the only consolidation that I have, it was at least the front of the envelope instead of the back of the envelope. So anyway, um, Michaela and I s thought that that's not systematic enough for our tastes and <laughs> we came up with a, more <laughs> with a more sort of professional answer to that question. We derived a, a mathematical model for that. Essentially the uh, model is you have uh, different genotypes that uh, correspond to different genetic uh, variance, covariance matrices and we ask how natural selection would act on those genes whose main effect is to change the covariances, the genetic covariance among phenotypic traits. You don't want to go through this. This is haploid model, the, uh, blah, blah, and we ignore uh, the, the uh, dynamic of gene matrices themselves due to changes in gene frequencies. We have two phenotypic uh, models and uh, 
alleles do not directly affect the mean of the phenotype. That's, of course, a steep assumption, and we are only, uh, so that is the same thing sort of graphically. So the one genotype uh, causes a covariance, genetic covariance among the, uh, that's higher, and here's a co uh, zero covariance. Okay, so are there RQTLs that don't affect uh, the mean phenotype and only uh, affect uh, the genetic covariance matrices? In the 2004 study, uh, uh, Jim found that 70% of the RQTLs, this relationship QTLs, have no detectable effect on the mean. In the more recent study, uh, there were 30% of those uh, uh, body size long bone RQTLs had no detectable effect on the mean. So most of the ones that had an effect of a mean had an effect on body size uh, and, and not on other characters. So, uh, so we assume for now that there's at least a subset of RQTLs out there that are, whose primary effect are to affect uh, uh, genetic covariances, but not uh, the mean itself. So then we have here the, oh God, this was supposed to be here. That comes from PC. Uh, 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 Macintosh transition, so this should be here. It's not fitness, it's the log fitness. So we do uh, 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 selection on the weak selection. The mean fitness only depends on the mean uh, phenotypes and not on the covariance matrix I itself. So if there is selection on the RQTLs, it has to come from a uh, linkage disequilibrium. We do a, a model of you know how selection on these uh, traits is actually happening. So it's basically two levels. At the one hand, you have selection on the RQTLs themselves, and then you have selection, a Landy-like selection on the, on the mean phenotypes uh, that are influenced by the covariance matrix that these genotypes are endowed with given their RQTL alleles, and then you, know, you do all the, the bookkeeping, and then a miracle occurs, and you come up with an equation uh, where we can actually show that the difference in mean fitness of the two RQTL uh, genotypes depends on the linkage uh, uh, between the RQTLs and all the others, and uh, something that depends on selection, and the previous the, the fitness difference in the previous uh, uh, selection. So all selection depends on, uh, on linkage disequilibrium, and uh, we can calculate how much this can be maximally, and so on. That's all you know, nice. And you can simulate it, and it turns out to be very easy to select for RQTL phenotypes. So in, a, in principle, if RQTLs exist in abundance, it shouldn't be hard to change pleiotropic effects under directional natural selection. How am I doing? OK. Uh, so this is the uh, conclusion from, from this section. RQTL selection can explain uh, patterns of, uh, of correlation as a result of natural selection. Um, Co-selection on traits leads to positive correlation, antagonistic selection to negative correlation because you select the appropriate RQTL alleles, and uh, selection only on one character selects for decoupling of characters, which means to a decrease of the genetic correlation between them. So that's actually what we want. Then patterns of pleiotropy and correlation may reflect the repeated pattern of directional uh, co-selection among traits. One thing I forgot to mention is uh, that it also happens, you know, it only works if you go in selection in one direction. It also happens if you have fluctuating selection always in the same direction. Then this uh, mode of selection also leads uh, to, uh, to the adaptation of the covariance matrix shape to the direction of selection. So you don't have to assume that, you know, there are tens of thousands of generations selection in one direction, which is quite unlikely. If you always select up and down, let's say, with higher temperature, lower temperature, the same thing happens. So I think it's possible that uh, RQTLs and uh, selection on them could explain patterns like this, where you know, selection on one character that is, like in the, in the case of the evolution of flight in bats, leads to a decrease of correlations between uh, fore and hind limb characters that would be ancestrally beta because of uh, serial homology. Um, then the question is, uh, so evolvability uh, is not well defined. Can we measure it? Is there any, any experimental evidence that this act actually plays a role? Um, and I only want to uh, briefly uh, point out uh, one study on my colleague uh, Paul Turner on uh, uh, experimental evolution of 5-6 viruses. And what they showed in a recent paper, I think it was also 2008, uh, that robustness uh, increases evolvability for thermotolerance in RNA viruses. And um, 
they essentially created by a means that I can explain in the discussion if we want, two strains of uh, viruses. One has a higher uh, robustness to mutation, the other one lower uh, robustness to mutation, but the same fitness under these selective conditions. And if they then select for, uh, for uh, growth under higher temperature, they find that the robust lineages on average have a higher evolvability. That means they reach higher uh, levels of fitness faster than the more brittle, uh, mutationally uh, less robust uh, strains. So that is, uh, I think, the first evidence where evolvability was directly measured in the laboratory, as far as I know, and actually find an effect between uh, robustness and, and evolvability. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have uh, time to, to hmm? three more minutes. Just briefly, a uh, completely different uh, direction of work that is, uh, uh, comes from a, uh, from a completely different uh, direction. That is the idea that uh, mutations get saved for bad times when, while the uh, times are good. And I want to uh, explain a little bit the East Bryan system that comes, of course, out of the Susan Lindquist uh, lab uh, at the time at the uh, University of Chicago. We all know what prions are, I assume, right? So those are folding states of proteins that are, uh, make them usually uh, non-functional, and it's also infectious because native proteins get folded in the presence of prions. Usually it's a bad thing, but in yeast it turns out to be, can be good. It turns out that, so here are, those are different strains of yeast, and these are different uh, you know, uh, antibiotics. And here you see growth in the presence when you induce the prion phenotype and without prions. So there are some genotypes in which if you induce the prion, they are better able to, uh, to confront the novel uh, 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 toxin in their environment than others. So in this strain, the prion phenotype has a, l a less uh, uh, growth rate than the, the native form. And that is, of course, a, a total genotype environment interaction because this strain in another environment is, in the, is the premier prion phenotype is, uh, is less uh, uh, fit. And it turns out that if you take this, all this data together, that in about 25% of cases of combinations of genotypes and environmental stressors, uh, the prion phenotype is actually the one that has the higher fitness. There's an incredibly high rate of sort of adaptive uh, variation that gets uh, uh, revealed through the prion phenotype. So how does this work? The prion phenotype is a phenotype that comes from a protein called SUP35, and it has two uh, domains in the protein, an N-terminal domain that is responsible for the ability to fold into a prion, and the other one is a transnational uh, termination activity. Essentially, it's the protein that says here, stop translating the RNA, right? And the interesting thing is that these two functions are actually completely separable. In order to have this translational um, termination activity, you don't need that part there. So why this is, is it still there? So that's quite surprising. And the way this release of genetic variation seems to work is that there are many pseudogenes in the, uh, in, in the yeast uh, genome that have premature stop codons. So it, at most, uh, a truncated protein gets produced from them. And behind the stop codon, uh, mutations accumulate without affecting the phenotype as long as the prion phenotype is not there. If in the, if the prion phenotype that comes to read through and this genetic variation becomes expressed, and it is probably this genetic variation that rescues under some conditions uh, these prion phenotypes in a, in, in a new uh, environment. And uh, that's the question is whether this ability to form prions can be maintained by selection. And there was a study by Jonah uh, Maisel and uh, Aviv Bergman that suggests based on sort of realistic uh, estimates of, of, of these prion uh, phenotypes is that it only takes about one selective challenge per million year to have enough advantage of the prion, uh, prion uh, ability to form prions to be maintained by selection. So I think this is one of the, uh, the only uh, case where we have both a molecular potential mechanism and some population genetic theory that uh, supports the notion that natural selection actually cares about evolvability and actually maintains it actively uh, a particular mechanism that has no other uh, apparent reason to be there uh, because you know you can do this translational termination activity without this part of the protein. Okay, with this I 
this is the summary. What's happening is then you, you get fixed the prion phenotypes by a back mutation of the of the stop uh, codon. And here are my conclusions, and I thank you for your attention.